Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago today, we were all witness to not only the greatest Hell in a Cell match of all time, but probably one of the best WWE matches ever. One of the most influential WWE matches ever. A match where we seen shit that we will never ever see again on WWE television. I am talking about the Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker versus Mankind. I remember exactly where I was when this match happened. I watched it live with my brother in our bedroom. I remember what I was doing, how I was laying with the fucking air conditioner on on a hot summer night. King of the Ring, you guys know if you've been listening to me for any time now, is one of my favorite pay-per-view concepts in WWE history. This match still stands the test of time, and I just wanted to say happy anniversary to this particular match because I still go back and watch the horrors and the brutality that this match gave us on this night. And this one image is probably my favorite of the two falls. Everybody goes back and watches the original fall and remembers the match for the original fall with JR's unbelievable commentary behind it. As God is my witness, he is broken in half. I actually think the second fall was the more devastating. I think the second fall was better than the first. To be completely honest with you, choke slamming him through the top of the cage, down to the ring with the steel chair hitting his face and then knocking a tooth into his fucking nose. And then The Undertaker climbs down, who reportedly had a bad foot or ankle during this match anyway, because you've seen him hobbling. He couldn't even climb the cage correctly. Choke slams Terry Funk out of his fucking shoes, and then they lock the fucking cage with these guys in there after what we've already seen so far. <laughs> you will never see a match like this ever again, man. My God. It's unbelievable, man. It is truly unbelievable, and it's something that if you guys want to go back on the WWE Network and watch, please do so. It's, it's absolutely amazing. No, no question. The best Hell in a Cell match of all time. One of the best, most influential matches in WWE history. So, happy anniversary to Mick Foley. It, it certainly is the most talked about thing of his career. And The Undertaker, who, again, you know, some snide remarks when I mentioned it the other day. Probably the greatest of all time. And that's a very subjective thing to say. Undertaker is... It's you don't even have a word to describe the Undertaker, man. He's he's literally you know when you think of professional wrestling and you think of WWE, that it's very difficult to to really you know sit there and say that there hasn't been anybody as as influential or more influential than the Undertaker. I mean, I, I might be you know stretching it a little bit there. You know, I'm not even I'm not even putting him in the category of the Hogan's and and the San Martinos, and the Backlands, and, and the Stone Coles, and the Rocks. He wasn't a guy that was the number one man of that company. He was never a number one guy in WWE, but he didn't need to be. He had the greatest character of all time, and he was part of some of the greatest moments that that, history, that, that company in its history will ever see. So... You know, it's just amazing, man. I'll never forget that fucking night. I was laying on my stomach, on my bed, with my brother laying on his bed, and we were just jaw drop when that fucking match was taking place, man. We didn't know what the fuck was going on. Unbelievable, man. So, happy anniversary to those uh, two guys there and to that match. And you guys can always watch that on the WWE Network. This is Off The Script Extra. A little bit of extra for you. On this Thursday, before we get into the weekend's festivities with episode 228. So I want to thank everybody for joining me. If you missed anything that I had done on the channel previously, please go and check everything that you might have missed. Kane is back on TV in 2018. 
Tony Storm and everybody else that took part in the Royal Albert Hall night one and night two. Both nights reviews are on the channel right now. Please go and check all that stuff out if you have indeed already watched the UK Championship stuff from Royal Albert Hall. And then Rollins and Ziggler can't save Monday Night Raw. There's also an NXT review thrown in there as well for this week. Actually, last night where we seen Tommaso Ciampa challenge Aleister Black for the NXT Heavyweight Championship, man. And what a moment that is going to be. Going to be great to see where they go with the NXT Championship, man. We got some stories today. We got one big one. We got a bunch of minor stories that we're not going to cover on Off The Script this weekend. Let's get into it, man. I got a lot of stuff to go over here. Going to start off with the big one, man. Backstage news on why WWE has canceled the multi-man match for Extreme Rules to crown a number one contender for the Universal Championship and Brock Lesnar. Why was it canceled? I'll give you one guess. That one guess. If you guessed Vince McMahon, you win absolutely nothing. Vince McMahon is indeed the answer to this question. Last week on Monday Night Raw, Kurt Angle, the general manager of Monday Night Raw, announced a multi-man match with details to be announced for Extreme Rules to crown a number one contender for Brock Lesnar's universal title. Bobby Trashley... And Roman Reigns were both named to the match, with more names to be announced. People were guessing Finn Balor, Elias threw his name into the hat. We didn't know where WWE was going with that match after that. Then this week, Angle announced that due to some contractual issues, which is complete bullshit, Lesnar will be at Summer Scam. Lesnar, right now is going to be there. He's just waiting around to see what WWE gives him at SummerSlam and how he's going to get paid. It's pretty much it. Do you honestly think Vince McMahon is going to allow Brock Lesnar to miss SummerSlam? You have to be out of your fucking mind. So, due to some contractual issues that I have news on this Friday, and I don't believe WWE's plan to get Roman Reigns over. You are going to sit there and ask yourself, are you fucking kidding me? Again? Wait till you hear Friday. So the match was canceled. All this contractual issue shit is all storyline. They canceled it per storyline. That was the on-screen reason for what happened. But what was the backstage reason? Well, Tuesday on Wrestling Observer Live, Brian Alvarez said, shed some light on this situation, talking about what caused the match to be changed. According to Alvarez, the reason was simple, and Vince McMahon changed his mind. That was it. Vince McMahon changed his mind on the match. Why did he change his mind? Was he thinking the same thing that we were thinking? Vince, too many multi-man matches, bro. We see one every fucking week. Can you give it a fucking rest already? Was that the reason? I would certainly hope so. But I don't know what the fuck that guy's thinking. Now, the previous week, McMahon had wanted to do a multi-man match and changed his mind at some point in between where Raw ended last week and when Raw began this week. Meaning the match was completely scrapped. Alvarez went on to say that the match had nothing to do with Lesnar, who was just waiting to be told what his plans will be at SummerSlam and who he will be defending the title against. This is what Alvarez said, and I quote, Yesterday, I guess I was talking about maybe Brock Lesnar really doesn't want to face Roman Reigns at this point again. Which could be true. We will never know. And if I'm a betting man, I'm going to say Lesnar doesn't want to face Roman Reigns again because what the fuck could they possibly do differently from what they did at WrestleMania and what they did at the Greatest Royal Rumble. No one is buying into the bullshit. Lesnar's a smart man. Paul Heyman is a smart businessman. This is not working. I wish these fucking people, instead of going on these random no-name fucking podcasts and, ex- and just screaming to the world, this is how you should book Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns needs to be healed. 
Then they want to sit there with their fucking tails tucked in between their legs and listen to Vince McMahon. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, Vince. We'll go with your idea. When his idea has failed every single year for four straight years. Enough is enough already. If I'm a betting man, I'm going with the fact that Lesnar might not want to face Roman Reigns again. He actually might want to face Bobby Lashley. But who the fuck wants to see that match? But it's certainly more interesting than a fucking Roman Reigns match. Now, maybe, he says, Lesnar wants to face Bobby Lashley because it's new, it's fresh. None of this is true. We don't know if any of this is true or not, he says. It was Vince that decided that he didn't want to do the multi-match, multi-man match match any week. Sometime during the week, he had decided, I don't want to do this anymore, and he just got rid of it. He scrapped it. That's the story. Had nothing to do with Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar is just sitting around waiting to find out what they're doing with him. Vince... Simply just changed his mind. Now, we don't know why he changed his mind. Is it because we have been given too many multi-man matches? Does Vince want to make it a little bit more of a personal ordeal between one and another? I don't know. We don't know. But look at it this way. You're getting a main event at Extreme Rules against A, Roman Reigns, who nobody gives a shit about. They are over it. You're getting A, Roman Reigns versus B, Bobby Trashley, who WWE has completely fucked up since his return to WWE. Nobody cares about Bobby Lashley. Nobody. This is the match that you're putting on in the main event. I guarantee you it's not going to be as bad as Chicago but you're going to get the same type of reaction that you got for Reigns and Mahal with Reigns and Lashley. Nobody wants these guys. WWE, please open your fucking eyes and clean out your ears. Listen to who the fans want. If it isn't Rollins or Strowman, then fuck it. It's over. I don't see how anybody in that company doesn't get the fucking clue. That's why they canceled it. Vince wants Reigns and Lashley in a personal one-on-one match, but we see right through it. We're gonna see right through it. It's not gonna matter to anybody. Lashley's done nothing. Reigns is yesterday's fucking news. Instead of going with the guy who's the hottest fucking guy in your company. Now they want to continue pushing Roman Reigns against Lesnar. What's gonna be different this time? Didn't you already tease us that Lesnar was going back to the UFC at WrestleMania? Are you really going to tell the same story again? We'll talk about it on Friday, man. My God, these people are absolutely fucking stupid. They are stupid. The WWE and their desire to have the Bullet Club in their company might have reached another level. Look at this. The WWE has followed Matt Jackson of the Young Bucks. This is not photoshopped. This is real. This is legit. Somehow, some way, someone in WWE has followed one member of the Young Bucks, and that member is Matt Jackson. Speaking of the Young Bucks, I actually went to Hot Topic this morning at Bay Plaza here in the Bronx. I actually went to go see if they had the new Funkos that they released two weeks early, the Hot Topic exclusive. I already have mine pre-ordered. I have Cody, Kenny, and the Young Bucks pre-ordered already from Pro Wrestling Tees. But there is a Hot Topic exclusive. I was 20 minutes late from getting my hands on one. They were sold out in minutes. And the guy said that there was a line out the door. So... I uh, I missed the boat on that. Uh, I didn't set my alarm. I completely forgot last night because I took a fucking melatonin pill and I passed out listening to Justin Labar's new wrestling reality podcast. So that was my night, and then I woke up. I'm like, yeah, it's 11 o'clock. How many people in the Bronx are going to really go to the Bay Plaza Mall here and go get Funko Pop with the Young Bucks? Apparently... I'm not the only idiot who collects them, but this is a real deal here. The Young Bucks were followed by WWE, or were they? Or were they? Apparently, uh, 
Something happened within the last 48 hours. It's a fun time to be a professional wrestling fan with so much great action taking place all over the world. The indie scene is blooming and blossoming again. In a way, it sort of feels like the territory system where wrestlers can wrestle elsewhere and become stars on their own before signing with the WWE. The Young Bucks have been able to create a buzz without the help of the WWE machine, but fans will continue to wonder if the day will ever come if they will sign eventually with the WWE. Recently, WWE promoted the Big E3 showdown between the Elite and the New Day, something that would have seemed unrealistic just a year ago. WWE has been more open to mentioning other companies on their website and social media accounts. Take that how you want to perceive it. I think WWE is just uh, buttering up those who they do not currently have right now. Um, They even dropped a TNA reference on Monday Night Raw, and Impact Wrestling's GWN app has been mentioned on the WWE Network in documentaries in exchange for rights to use some of their footage, which is a good business move. You need the footage? You want to tell a greater story? Boom. You got to pay. So, could the Young Bucks finally sign with the WWE after the contracts expire in December? It might be too early to know, but fans were quick to notice that the official WWE account, currently following only 386 accounts, recently started following Matt Jackson. Why is this a big deal? Well, the WWE official Twitter account primarily follows accounts of wrestlers only under contracts or companies that they do business with. In rare instances, with the UFC, they do follow non-WWE accounts. In addition to the Young Bucks deal expiring in late December, Kenny Omega's deal expires in January 2019. It will be a very interesting seven months for all parties involved here. Now, they followed the Young Bucks, but within the last, uh, I'd say, 48 to 72 hours, no more. The Young Bucks lost a verified follower in WWE. So, WWE followed Matt Jackson recently, and I'm sure he noticed when WWE's official Twitter account popped up in his notifications. The problem might be that other people noticed as well. This really happened. Like I said, no images were photoshopped showing WWE's Twitter account following the Young Bucks. But in a very interesting turn of events, as the days of our lives move on, the WWE's Twitter account unfollowed. Matt, sometime this week. So it might have just been an accident, which is bullshit, but it's still a very interesting one. You don't follow anyone on Twitter by accident. You have to move said mouse, and you have to go to the follow button and move the cursor over and then hit that little click, and you follow somebody. You physically have to move it to where it says follow. Something was done on purpose and not by accident. Or somebody was really in the mood to lose their jobs that day because they did something that they shouldn't have done. But it was no by it was no accident. WWE uh, might be trolling, they might be, you know, fucking around, they might be sending more smoke signals out there without actually saying, hey, we want you guys in our company by doing these little these little things just on social media and mentioning them on the website and writing up articles about him and then putting Kenny Omega in the Gems Collection on the WWE Network. They're pretty much telling you without actually saying, uh, hey guys, uh, when you want a much larger deal than what your current employer is paying you, come on over, man. We got the price for you. The price is going to be right over here. I'm not talking about fucking Bob Barker or Drew Carey now, but nobody's going to best Bob Barker on The Price is Right. Uh, but this was no accident. This was done purposely. Uh, it's going to be another interesting seven months here with the talks only intensifying. Um, you know, it's subjective. Some people think that they should go. Some people think that they shouldn't go. They're going to make much more money. You know, what about creative control? What about time away from the family? All that time on the road. They don't really need to be treated like everybody else. You know, it's going to be a very interesting thing. Right now, honestly, the one thing that I think the elite have in their favor is getting what they truly think they deserve from WWE. If WWE wants them, which I know that they do, because they don't want to work with any outside promotion, they want to kill every outside promotion. You think WWE wants to work with New Japan? You fucking out of your mind. WWE's vision right now is, how can we kill New Japan? That's it. 
They don't want to work with them. They don't give a fuck about them. They don't give a shit. What goes on there? How do we kill anybody that is threatening our company? Take. We don't want to work with you. We don't want to give you any notoriety. We want, and that's it. So fuck this shit about working relationships and this and that. You know, a working relationship where I see W and Progress and Evolve and all these other fucking UK companies. That, that's, that's minor league shit. You think WWE is ever going to work with New Japan Pro Wrestling? You have to be on some type of fucking drug. You have to be living in a fantasy world. It ain't never going to happen. WWE's mindset right now, right now is, how do we kill New Japan? We did it with AJ, the club, and Nakamura. We're going to do it again. WWE is smart and they want these guys, you let go a little bit of that fucking chain that you got on everybody. You give these guys what they want and you give them some creative control. They're only going to make your company that much better. With them comes a lot of fans and a lot of fucking money. Let's do the right thing here. But I don't, ex I don't expect WWE to do the right thing because I think the people up top who run this company don't give a fuck about professional wrestling. So they're just going to look at the Young Bucks as, oh, look, more money coming our way. And, and then they'll sign them, they'll waste them, kill them, and then everybody's going to have a fucking outrage. Can't happen that way. Maybe it's better, better off if they don't go to WWE. I don't know. We'll see. It's going to be a very interesting seven months. Rounding out the news here, man. Howard Finkel is the greatest in-ring announcer in professional wrestling history. There is nobody better. When I hear Finkel's voice, it makes me just instantly think of my childhood, man. There's things in this life that remind you instantaneously of the great moments of your childhood. Howard Finkel's voice is that. Now, apparently he is dealing with some health issues the last several months. A friend of Finkel saw him a few months ago and, and told sources that he has lost weight. He was very heavy. If you guys watched him on uh, that Legends house, he, he was very overweight. You know, it's quite scary. But he's lost weight since then, but it's unclear if he's, if he's losing weight by, by normal means or if he is dealing with current health issues right now. Finkel's voice was actually used for The Undertaker's introduction at Raw 25 in January, but that audio was pre-taped. He wasn't in the arena because he was not able to travel. Finkel is 68 years old, known by most longtime WWF fans as the best ring announcer of all time. He is also the longest tenured employee in the company. Finkel began working for Vince McMahon Sr. and his Worldwide Wrestling Federation in 1975. Wow. Two years before he was given the permanent role as ring announcer, Finkel is also the man who coined the phrase WrestleMania based on the Beatlemania term. His on-air role with WWE was reduced in the early 2000s when the company hired Lillian Garcia and Tony Chimmel, but he continued to work behind the scenes as the company uh, had him in the offices of Stanford, Connecticut. In recent years, he was the ring announcer uh, for the WWE Hall of Fame inductions at WrestleMania, but he was uh, away from the company and WrestleMania since 2016. He told friends last year that he could not travel to WrestleMania 33 in Orlando because he was ill. In April, he celebrated 38 years of employment with WWE. Certainly well wishes to Howard Finkel. Uh, the greatest voice that WWE has ever had behind the microphone in that ring doing ring announcing, man. Absolutely no question. Sting. Sting was great friends with Vader. Sting actually comforted Vader in the last months of his life. This is a great fucking story. Listen to this. Everybody feels the same way that we lost Vader way too soon. It was a shame he was never inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. You know, it's something that he wanted. And, you know, the WWE Hall of Fame is nothing but a political fucking bullshit agenda by Vince McMahon. Whether they like you or not, that's when you go in. And it sucks that this guy was never recognized for that while alive. You know, now everybody wanted it when he was alive. They could have easily gave it to him to give him one last hurrah, knowing that he came out saying that he has health issues. Instead, they waited. Now they're going to put him in when he's no longer with us and have his son induct him on his behalf. It's kind of shitty. They did the same thing with fucking Macho Man. Macho Man should have been in fucking... The, the, the day he fucking left the business, he should have fucking went in. Ridiculous. 
Vader did have a lot of interaction with a WWE Hall of Famer before he passed away, and his name is Steve Borden, Sting. Vader's son, Jesse White, spoke to TMZ, where he revealed Sting was a huge part of Vader's life in the months leading to his father's passing. He would come over and read the Bible with Vader and helped him a lot during the final months of his life. I quote, Sting has been blessing, or Sting has been a blessing, not only as of recent, but probably, I want to say, in the last 10 months to a year in my father's life, as well as mine, Jesse White said. I've been blessed and fortunate to witness that relationship between the two of them, as well as a developing relationship with Sting for myself. My father was a God-fearing man, and so is Sting, but... They would sit down and read the Bible together and just talk about good time stories. So yeah, Sting has been a huge blessing throughout this entire process. Jesse is also starting a project where he is encouraging fans to send in whatever memories, photos, videos, or anything else that they might have of Vader to him. It will always be Vader time, and hopefully with this project and other things Jesse has down the line in Leon White's memory that they will live on forever. Man, that's a great fucking story. That Sting actually went out of his way to go sit with Vader in the last months of his life and comfort him the way he did, man. So I don't see that being reported anymore. I wanted to throw that in there uh, here on Off The Script Extra. So that's great, man. That's great to hear. And again, we lost him way too soon. One of the greatest, if not the greatest big man for his size in this business. Top NXT star out with a major injury. Looks like Oni Lorkin. We'll be taking some time off. PW Insider reports that he suffered a broken orbital bone last weekend, during uh, a couple weekends ago, rather, uh, at his match with uh, with the Undisputed Era and Danny Burch at TakeOver at Chicago. Lorkin teamed with Danny Burch, like I said, to take on Undisputed in Chicago, but was noticeably absent at this past week's TV tapings in Orlando. It's unfortunate timing for him because he was in the middle of his biggest push ever since being signed to a contract in 2015. There was no word on how long he will be out of action, but he will be getting surgery as soon as possible. For a comparison, Austin Aries was approximately out for five months before he broke his orbital bone, or after he broke his orbital bone, rather, in late 2016 from a shot taken on a Kinshasa by Shinsuke Nakamura. So, Oni Lorcan could be out the rest of the year, and a guy who's just getting his big break now in the tag team division of WWE in NXT... To be out five months. Someone like Oni Lorcan, man. You know, I, I don't know what WWE feels about Oni Lorcan. But if it was anybody on a much larger scale, they probably wouldn't have to worry half as much about coming back and then kind of reclaiming their spot when they return. Oni Lorcan, a lot's going to change in five months in NXT. So for a guy like Oni Lorcan, it might be a little bit more difficult to get back to where he was, man. This is why guys wrestle injured. This is why guys really don't bring injuries to the table immediately. They don't want to lose their spot. Something like this cannot be overlooked. I feel bad for Lorcan because that was one of the best tag team matches all year. So hopefully he recovers quick. He gets back. I I enjoy the team of Danny Burch and Owen Lorcan. And I want to see them, you know, continue to succeed in NXT. But this is just a uh, wrong place at wrong time type of deal. He probably will be out in the vicinity of four to five months, and that is a damn shame. Finally, guys, Charlie Caruso leaving WWE. One of the few that doesn't sound like a fucking resident android on Monday Night Raw. Charlie Caruso is quickly quickly becoming an extremely popular backstage face in WWE. Her interview skills and ability to show her personality on the microphone during these segments really take a considerable amount of skill, being that everybody sounds like Fucking uh, Android 2.0. Dasha Fuentes. Sounds like a fucking uh, robot off the conveyor belt. Caruso is also incredibly in shape, which is something she takes very seriously as well. Caruso recently celebrated a personal accomplishment when she became officially licensed as a personal trainer. Charlie was quick to let fans know that she had no intention of leaving WWE, but it's nice to see that she has a backup plan just in case her road leads her away from the WWE. If you follow Charlie Caruso on social media, then you are well aware how seriously she takes her workouts, and now it looks like some people will be lucky to get the chance to receive some personal training from Charlie Caruso. One advantage of having a personal trainer who is also a skilled interviewer is the fact that she'll ask you questions while you work out, which could really help someone stay focused if you think about it. Congratulations to Charlie on this awesome Accomplishment. So there were rumors going around that Charlie was leaving the WWE, but 
Fear not, she's not going anywhere. It's always great to have a plan B because you never know what might happen in the world of professional wrestling. WWE could let you go like that. You might get another offer somewhere else. Something might not work out, but you always have that to fall back on and say, fuck wrestling. I got my own home business. I'm just going to be completely fine on this new endeavor. So Charlie Caruso is not going anywhere. She ain't leaving the WWE, and we don't have to worry about that. So at least we still have one person outside Renee Young that has some type of fucking normal charisma when she's interviewing the likes of a Seth Rollins or a Roman Reigns or a Finn Balor, and they don't sound like Dasha Fuentes, and I don't know how to speak to you like a normal human being. I'm getting the hell out of here. I'll see you guys later. I'll see you guys later. If I have, if I have anything else for uh, Off the Script Extra, I'll give you guys another video sometime today. But uh, probably this will be it until Friday tomorrow. So thank you guys so much, man. If you missed any of my videos, please go check them out. Uh, I would greatly appreciate your support on that stuff. If you have not watched the UK stuff yet, please do so and then watch my review on it and get my take on it. I know a lot of you guys have not watched it yet, so those videos are kind of doing slow right now and trending slow because... You know, A, it's NXT, and B, a lot of you guys have not watched it yet, so please go and do so. Uh, and then you got Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live, and NXT, so those videos are live on the channel right now as well. Hit a thumbs up on this video, hit that subscribe button down below, turn on that bell for all notifications, and I'll see you guys right back here tomorrow night, normal time, for Off The Script, episode 228. We're going to go over week in WWE review, and we're going to reveal Vince McMahon's new plan for Roman Reigns and how to get him over. What does it mean? And what are they going to do? I don't know. But whatever they got planned is going to culminate in New York City. And if they think it's going to work in the Big Apple, they might buy, They might be the dumbest fucking people, I think, running a wrestling promotion. Period. So we'll talk about that tomorrow on Off The Script. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you then. Have a great Thursday, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for Off The Script.